and welcome back to the Disenfranchised Podcast. That's right, we're back. That podcast all about those franchises of one, those films that fancy themselves full-fledged franchises before falling flat on their face after the first film. I am your host, Stephen Foxworthy, and joining me as always, we respect him for his mind, but we know you perverts are just lusting after his body. It's Tucker. Hey, Tucker. Hi, Stephen. How's it going? Not bad, man. How are you? Well, I think I have a hair in my mouth again. <laughs> Your That's a problem that happens. Long. Like, no, I feel like every three to four episodes, there's a hair in my mouth, and we have to deal with it. Luckily, that one plucked it right out. I don't That's know where good. it came from. Sometimes it comes from my gloves. I like, I don't just know. just rubbing your facial hair, and it just gets in there. Unless you know, I have a cat. So, oh, you do. You do have could a cat. Could be a cat hair. Could Who be knows? a cat hair. Uh, our our co-host Brett Wright is he just bought a shiny new car and he's kind of obsessed with it hopefully someday he like looks away and is able to come back but until then Brett we love and miss you uh, but joining us in his stead today um, God I'm so excited to have her on it's been a long time coming she is um, the host of one of the hosts of the Halloweenies podcast she is one of the hosts of Girls on the Boys she's part of the regular panel on the pod and the pendulum and probably most relevant to our discussion today she is also one of the hosts of the Losers Club podcast the Stephen King approved Stephen King podcast please welcome the great Rachel Reeves Rachel welcome Oh my gosh, thank you. I feel so welcome after that intro, and I am honored that you have asked me to be here tonight to talk about one of my favorite, absolute favorite movies of all time, so cannot be more excited to be here. And what movie is it that we're talking about tonight, Rachel? Oh my goodness, we are talking about John Carpenter's 1983 love story, Christine. Christine. Christine, yes, directed by the great, not late, but still great John Carpenter, um, and starring Keith Gordon, John Stockwell, Alexandra Paul, Robert Prosky, the great Robert Prosky, the late great Harry Dean Stanton, Christine Belford, Roberts Blossom, and is yeah. that, yes, it is, Kelly Preston in this movie as well. What a cast. Friends, what a picture. That's uh, that's got to be like the third or fourth movie that Roberts Blossom has been in that we've covered. I and we, I always I always mention you guys got to see Deranged if you haven't seen Deranged. No, he basically I plays Deranged. Ed Gein, mm. and uh, it's as if he wasn't has terrifying. Range. Yeah, if he wasn't terrifying enough, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's the thing is like in Deranged, he's like super low key, like very quiet and like subtle and. It's real good. Uh, Tom, one of the first movies Tom Savini worked on. It's, oh, okay. it's really great. You guys should check it out. Yeah. I'm sure we'll probably cover it on a straight up one of these days. Oh, um, it's on the list. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Um, no, I, of course, know Robert's Blossom best as the South Bend Shovel Slayer from Home Alone. From Home Alone, yeah. But, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the late 80s, early 90s. What can I say? I, okay, I've seen this film 800,000 times and it was mm-hmm. literally just the last time we were, I was in Chicago and I was watching this at the music box. Mm-hmm. I was like, it hit me and I lean over to my friend, Jen, my fellow losers club co-host. And I was like, Holy shit. It's the same guy in home alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know why. Like I just wasn't, it's just cause like how he looks, I guess he's so gross and Christine and he, like, he's scary. In Home Alone, he's, but also like well dressed and like he, he ends up ages also- a lot in those seven years between 1983 <laughs> and 1990. Oh, he, yeah. he he lives a life in those seven years. <laughs> Goodness, I just don't know why I never connected those two. But it's just one of those. He weird shows up things. in a lot of stuff. Like you'll just be watching a random thing, and you're like, oh hey, it's Homeboy from Home Alone. Yeah. Yeah, he is he is he is one of those guys. There's another um gentleman whose name is escaping me at the moment. I know he is in They Live and Back to the Future. He's got another his last name I think is Flowers. And Flowers. He's like um, in Flowers. Oh no. I I just <laughs> I just watched the the season finale to True Detective season 1. I don't want to talk about Flowers, man. Uh, I don't want to talk about making flowers, dude. No. George Buck Flower is the actor's name. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just two of those great character actors with, you know, very flowery, floral last names. I, I, I dig it a lot. So, yeah, of course, 
in the time it took me to look that up, everyone in there is like screaming at their podcatchers because <laughs> they they knew that and I didn't, and that's just what it is to be a podcaster. Um, that's how it goes. So we are kicking off a uh, a three week mini series slash mini theme month called the Kinging the Drawing of Three. Since we took last week off, we're dedicating the rest of this month to Stephen King failed franchise starters. We've covered one before. We covered The Dark Tower a couple of years ago. Mm. Uh, Brett and I had our friends uh, Mandy and Molly Gossage on the program to talk about that film. Uh, And I shared my history with Stephen King, but I don't know your guys' histories with Stephen King. And Rachel, of course, you are... You're a Losers Club co-host. Like you, <laughs> you're you host the 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 Stephen King approved Stephen King podcast. Like, um, what is your history with Stephen King? How did you get into him? When did you first engage with Christine? What's your history with the book, the movie? I want to know everything. Oh goodness, yes. So as far as like Stephen King, the author, my mom was a librarian. Mm. Um, and so not surprisingly, read a lot of books and I got into him, my first book that I read by him was The Talisman, which I think is mm. a really odd entry point into Stephen King because it's I more think that, like a... You might be the only person that has that as their entry, honestly. <laughs> no, it's because my mom would like read a lot of fantasy novels and stuff like that. So I, like, I felt like I was kind of drawn to that just because that's what she was into. And I think that falls more into the fantasy realm of things. I think that's where it was shelved. And so I read that and then... Uh, second book I read was The Stand, so I feel like it, like the horror stuff came a little bit later. Mm. You know, obviously The Stand has like some some horrific elements to it, but I still am not sure that's what he's, you know, in the, in the world of horror, anyways, what he's known for. And right. so, yeah, all the horror stuff came much later, and that was a bit of a eye-opening experience for me because I don't have any older siblings. I don't have any, like, so I kind of had to discover that on my own. I didn't know. This was also pre-internet, you guys. So, like, I didn't necessarily know that he was, like, a big horror dude. Uh, So that kind of came later. And then just, you know, couldn't get enough. Couldn't get enough. And then uh, Christine, the movie, I actually saw before I read the book. Um, I was obsessed with Greece when I was mm. in middle school. Obsessed with it. I know that I think that is kind of one of those universe for like w- like women our age, I think it that's kind of like a yeah. universal thing because just about every girl in my middle school was also obsessed with Greece. Yeah. Well our moms loved it. Oh, so... oh wait, is that what you're saying? Like I'm <laughs> No, <laughs> like, no, I'm I'm, I'm... <laughs> No, I'm I'm 41 years old. I'm saying my mm-hmm. my mother liked it, and that's why I was exposed to it. And I have to imagine that's why a lot of people my age, at least, uh, yeah, like, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. I like. I don't remember who showed it to me, but I, I'm sure it has to be my parents. And I I loved the cars, you guys. I loved the 50s. I thought. I mean, I think everybody is so hot in that movie. And yeah, I loved the car. Was obsessed with that. Wanted Grease Lightning. And then one day my dad, like I was, had just gone to bed and then he woke me up and he's like, oh, you love Greece? You got to watch Christine. And so he showed me Christine and that How was- How old were you like, at this point? I mean, I think I was like 14 when I okay. saw it and it just, was just playing on TV. It just happened to be on and he wanted me to see it because he knew that I loved Greece. And so that was my introduction to it and just fell head over heels in love with it and the car. That was a big part of it. And so, yeah, like my very first car that I bought was a 1951 Chevy business coupe because mm. I was so obsessed with like those 50s cars. Wow. Like I it was like, I want one and I got one. Nice. <laughs> and so like that, and my dad like has always like had hot rods and restored them. So I had somebody who could help me and like helped me find it and, you know, supported me in that way. Um so I wanted, I lived, I lived Christine. So this movie has always like resonated really heavily with me because I feel like I understand Arnie in a very special way that we can talk about more as we go on. But that's my, that's my background a little bit with King and specifically with this movie. And yeah, I've never, never stopped loving King and I'm just so grateful that I get to talk with all of my fellow losers about him all the time incessantly. So. <laughs> When did you get to the book? When did you when did you read the book for the first time? And then compared to the movie, like how did you engage with that? 
Yeah, I read the book not terribly long after because I was like, well, I got to know about this. I got to know all that. Oh, that's what this is about. Like a car. Of course, I got to read this. Um, and obviously, the book has some differences that I was a mm-hmm. little like, oh, OK. And now that I feel like at the time I was like, mm, I don't know, that's kind of weird. Uh, but I was also just, you know, 14, 15 years old or whatever. <laughs> so sure. now I'm like, OK, I totally understand why carpenter did what he did to make those changes it makes so much more sense from like a film perspective like okay we just need to simplify this a little bit agreed yeah yeah absolutely agree um thank you tucker what about you where when did you when did you engage with king first what was your first exposure when did you see this movie read this book tell me everything man uh well uh my mom really liked carrie it's one of her favorite Mm. movies still Mm. Um, so I was kind of introduced to King that way. Um, when I was in middle school, I started getting, uh, after I saw it, the mini series for it, after I saw that on TV and I was in middle school, I was, I was excited about Stephen King after that. So I kind of, I got like every book of his that I could from the library and I read most of them. And to be honest, I kind of binged them. Mm. So a lot of them, I don't really remember a lot about. Okay. Um, okay. And Christine, yeah. Christine was one of the ones that I read during that time. Uh, I saw the movie uh, probably when I was like 15 or 16. Uh, Cause like I was, my roots are in horror. I, I consider myself to be kind of a, a, a broad cinema fan now, but like I started out heavily into horror. So Christine was, you know, part of that horror education uh, and I liked it, but I just never really gave it a second thought after I saw it. And I always forget that John Carpenter directed it. <laughs> when I'm talking about John Carpenter movies, it never enters my mind. I feel um, like there's a reason for that. And we'll we'll get into be. that, I'm sure. But yeah. No, it's weird because it, there's a lot of things in this movie that are very obvious staples of John Carpenter films. But as a whole, yeah, it yeah. doesn't. You know what I mean? It's it's like the Fargo TV show versus the Fargo movie. Mm. Like it's not it's not the whole thing, it's just pieces. You know, it kind of it kind of feels like I don't know. I don't know if he was uh completely into it as much I, as he was. I, I'll just, oh, no, I'll just I get into it. Past. He was not yeah. at all. Yeah. Like this still, was a job. He was a director for hire on this and he's like this was a career move for me. I didn't really think it was that scary. I just did it cuz I needed to. Well, and that 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 speaks well of John Carpenter because it's still it's still a fantastic movie. Yeah. Like even if he was kind of phoning it in by his own account, it's still fantastic. I just I think at the time that I saw it, I was more interested in other aspects of horror and other aspects of cinema, so it didn't really stick with me. Uh this time I really enjoyed it though. Um I don't know how soon I'll watch it again, but I think there's definitely repeat viewings in my future. Yeah, I I first caught this one in 2020 when I did my John Carpenter watch through when I just binged all the Carpenter movies that I could didn't watch them in order or anything just kind of watch them like as I found them. Um, And by the time I got to Christine, I'd seen most of like the canonical classics by that point. And so I was kind of mixed on Christine. I I liked it, but it was it didn't like wow me Um, watching it kind of isolated from the rest of Carpenter's oeuvre, I think I was able to appreciate a lot more what he's doing with this one. And I think given what we've, what we culturally have been through over the course of the past, like seven or eight years, it really, really resonates a lot more um, now uh, in a lot of ways, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into, but particularly with regard to like just the concept and notion of weaponized nostalgia, um, Mm was was particularly um particularly interesting for me on this watch through so yeah yeah that's so interesting because yeah maybe this because i think this was the first john carpenter movie i saw because yeah growing up i was not allowed to watch a lot of horror my parents were pretty conservative with what they kind of like let me see um and i think it's just mainly because my 
parents weren't big horror people. Like my dad was more of like an action guy. So it's like, oh yeah, I saw Predator and Terminator and, you know, First Blood. But like, <laughs> somehow like horror movies like were like, oh no, you can't watch that. Like, That's what? the bridge too far. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I didn't actually get to see a lot of that stuff until I was in high school and, you know, could babysit other people's children. Mm -hmm. And then I could watch those things at other people's houses while my parents weren't looking and I was old enough to rent the VHSs by myself. You know? right. So that didn't come until much later. So I, I think that's, I didn't have anything to compare it to. So it's interesting hearing, you know, you say that like, this was, you know, you, you had seen other Carpenter stuff before that. And I'm just wondering if that's part of why the, like this is so impactful for me, because this was my first introduction to John Carpenter. I hadn't seen Halloween. I hadn't seen the thing. So I was coming at it just baby, you know, doe eyed, like, what is this magical thing? And so I just, I, yeah, it's always is, such a special place in my heart. Is this your favorite Carpenter? I don't know if oh, that's a big question. It's up it there is. though. Okay. I mean, it's probably like top three okay yeah it's in wow. the top three i would have to think really hard about you know between halloween and the thing like where i'm gonna put those but the fact that i'm struggling right now on the spot to place them... that that speaks volumes <laughs> honestly as to your love for this movie um yeah. so absolutely, oh, and, i mean no. i don't know ghost of mars is in there too i'm just kidding i hate that <laughs> <laughs> look no you, there is no judgment here no judgment at this table whatsoever <laughs> No, you like what you like. That is okay. Um, it honestly, not even my least favorite Carpenter movie. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just put that out there. Oh, yeah, that's Mars, a good, not, yeah, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> that, that is. Look, even, even Carp Carpenter is the kind of guy who will admit that some of those probably aren't great. Um, oh, yeah. Like Friedkin's another one of those guys that you're like, look, a lot of movies I made were absolute shit. That's just what it is. So, um, no, but I. I can appreciate that about Carpenter. He's just like, nah, I didn't, didn't really connect with that one. That was just, you know, it was just a thing I felt like I had to do. So, yeah, but it's so yeah. interesting to me, this one, because from what I understand, like post the thing and how, like how bad that like flopped, this was like, okay, now I just got to like do some stuff and pay some bills and like make a comeback basically. Yeah. And like this, was this and Starman. Right, you, you come back with like I love Starman too, which Starman is great. Yeah. Oh, if you want to know, yeah. if put it, make a connection. My very that car that I told you that I bought, that mm -hmm. that exact car, well, not exact, but like that make, model, color, everything is the car that Jeff Bridges drives in Starman. Hell yeah! If you want a, a visual, <laughs> that's what, that's what my car was. <laughs> Hell yeah! Love that for you. Honestly, would love that for anybody. That's amazing. Um. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, yeah, Carpenter is, I don't know, he's, he's one of those canonical guys. Um, but yeah, I can, I can absolutely always appreciate, like, he's, the thing is very much a passion project, kind of his, one of his bigger blank checks um, after the success of Halloween. And it yeah. bombs so spectacularly because it comes out like the week after E.T., just bombs so spectacularly that he he's immediately on his heels immediately now in damage control mode he's originally working on firestarter that's mm -hmm. his original project and then that falls through for some reason i don't have a lot of the specifics on that but that falls through and then he ends up getting punted this one the rights actually are purchased before the novel's finished the movie goes into production before the novel is published so both the movie and the novel come out in 1983, which is rare. <laughs> Very yeah, the rare. Way, the way I understand it, the reason he didn't do Firestarter is because Universal was not happy with the returns from the thing. And that's Probably. why he, like, I think he, yeah, I got, he went I elsewhere fired, yeah. <laughs> and did. Yeah, he basically got fired. Okay, that, that explains it then, yeah. And then he gets punted over to Columbia who are anxious to have a name to direct their Stephen King adaptation. And if you look at the Stephen King adaptations up to this point, they've generally been directed by names. Um, De Palma directs mm -hmm. Carrie. You've got um, all the names just went right out of my head. Cronenberg oh, no. um, with the dead zone. Um, yep. I'm trying to think of what, uh, this is only like the third or fourth one that get a uh, Kubrick, of course, for the shining, like, like the big names are directing these Stephen King movies. Like he is the biggest name in literature at this point. And so they're able to pull in a lot of big names for the directors. Now that changes 
within a few years of this, but like, I think you get Romero on creep show and you get like a few others, but then like the, the, the directors uh, of promise start passing and, and doing other things uh, very soon after this. But this is still in that like King is hot enough stuff that everybody wants a piece. Yeah, it's just that weird, interesting thing that horror has always had to like deal with, right? Like where certain people, they don't want to take on the projects because it's like, oh, it's just a horror movie. And that's, I mean, that's right. something that I, that King has always like, st- not struggled with, but had to contend with was just being mm-hmm. pigeonholed as like a horror writer when it's, you know, he writes all sorts of different things, but yeah, it, you don't get the same respect, whether it's literature or film because it's horror and i you know so i think a lot of it's interesting when you chart kind of king's popularity where yeah like all these like names want to make his movies and then it kind of like drops off and then oh Mm -hmm. nope now everybody it's prestige again and now everybody wants on a king movie because it's you're gonna get writer does misery and here we go yeah oh yeah and yeah shawshank and stand by me and then it's like all of a sudden you get kind of that oh wait this is a stephen king thing it's like yeah guys Duh. Yeah, there's a, there's other stuff out there, and so it's he it's contains really interesting. multitudes. Yeah, I know, it's so weird. And I mean, I know, and I know King has said like he's the literary equivalent of like a Big Mac and fries, but there's something to be said for a Big Mac and fries sometimes. Like sometimes you just sometimes you just want a quick bite, you know, something that that goes down easy, and something that you know what you're gonna get. Um, mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean there's no artistry to it. That doesn't mean it didn't take work and effort to put together. Um, it's just, you know, it's it's a fairly mass produced thing that he's yeah. that he's making um, because a lot of people really love it. A lot of people engage with it because and just because it's popular doesn't mean it's bad. No, and vice versa. And it's so interesting with some of his stuff because it's like it's just it's so simple. But somehow, mm-hmm. like he's able to just create magic with that like oh you know possessed car christine like oh rabid dog cujo like it's just like so it was like oh creepy clown it like it, you know it's just so iconic with imagery and it's just so easy to sell because you yeah you see that and you know exactly what it is and it's so simple <laughs> but yet he's right. able to create so much within that world and i think that's why so much so many of his projects are so perfect for adaptation because Mm -hmm. like we see with christine it's so it's very easy to kind of boil it down and make it work in an hour and a half window like it doesn't have to be some crazy epic um it's it's easy even the shining which obviously (laughs) King has mixed feelings on, but even that is, right. you know, Kubrick was able to pull out certain things and kind of boil it down to these basics. And obviously it's very artsy, but what he's representing is really just the core of that story. And that core is what makes these films and these projects and these books so powerful and so iconic. Right. I, I, I've always said, or long said that I like Stephen King's premises. Like Mm -hmm. I think I'll read like a premise or a synopsis for a King book and be like, I want to engage with that. And then I start reading it and I just get bogged down in the details and I get like so overwhelmed by all the minutia. And I know he's painting a picture and he's trying to create like a full vision of something. And I just, but I personally, me, I just kind of get bogged down and all that. And it's difficult for me to push through. Um, I, I got about, I did get about halfway through Salem's lot before I had to put it down. And then I just, I, I didn't pick it back up. I want to, yeah. like I have it, it's there. I, I enjoyed what I read of it though. Like I didn't, because I understood that one, the scope of that one is much larger than some of his others. And so I was on board for what that was. Yeah. Um, but like when I tried to pick up and read like any number of others, like desperation or. Oh, well, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Had you told me that sooner, I mean, it's just you know, where were a, you, Rachel? To start as a rough place to start. I right. would say, based on what you're saying, I would recommend going for some of the short story collections. Right, and I th- I think that may be the move. Like I also have uh, eleven twenty two sixty three on uh, audiobook. Mm, um, that's great. Yeah, so I, I, and I've yeah, gotten about halfway that. through that one. So yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, audiobooks are great for that, especially with some of those larger. <laughs> 
you know, tomes. <laughs> That's like a 30 hour listen on oh, Audible. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a, it's I just a mammoth. Did that. We just covered that. And so, yeah, we did six episodes on that book Damn. Of, on just the book. So yeah, understandable. Right. Um, so you haven't even gotten to the, to the Franco miniseries yet, have you? Oh yeah. No, we're covering that later this month. So that's coming. Okay. Okay. Um, Teasers right on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I would recommend do, tapping into some of the short stories because there you're really getting, you've got a good um, like breadth of size and scope too. Like some of them are, yeah, like some of them can be kind of like, well, is this a short story? Is this a novella? I don't know. Like, I don't actually know like what the like defining page count is for like novella versus you know a short story because there yeah there's some that are 150 pages or whatever but then you've also got some that are 20 pages so right yeah and i mean he's and again he's he's prolific in that he can write for like christine started as a short story about a car whose odometer ran backwards and then by the end it's just its component parts laying on the ground like that was the initial concept he's like this is going to be a fun short story yeah. And then he starts pulling in all these other things. And the next thing you know, it's a 500 plus page novel. Mm -hmm. And he's saying all these things about, um, you know, 50s nostalgia and um, looking back and going forward and obsession and being a teenager and yeah. all this other stuff that's kind of woven itself into that narrative, which, and again, it just started as a very short story. So um it's, I don't know, I, I find, again, I find his ideas very fascinating, um, but I always tend to get a little bogged down in his execution. That's always been kind of my line on King. I'm I'm still willing to engage. Like, he's one of yeah. my partner's favorite authors. Like, she's a, she's a fan of his. So I, I need... I need I need to get into Stephen King is, is well, what I'm you learning. You don't need so. to. It's just because he is so prolific and because mm. he does dip his toe into so many genres. I think that it's just finding the king that works for you because, yeah, it's, you know, you put out that many things, you're going to have some stinkers and you're going to mm. have some, like, you knock it out of the park. And obviously when you know, like, as so many people do, his history Mm. his personal history and everything that he's gone through and the ups and downs of his own personal life and things that he struggled with. I mean, you can chart that in his output. So yeah, if you're right. jumping in a dream catcher, <laughs> you're going to get a very different <laughs> King than right. you would have, you know, 20 years earlier and, or that you would 20 years later, you know? So it's, right. I think it's, yeah, I, I, can, I can totally understand where you're coming from. And I, I have faith that you will find the story and you're going to be like, this is what everybody, this is it. This is what they were talking about. Like, this is the attraction. And I'm excited to hear when that happens, what that story is, because it seems to I, be different for everybody. <laughs> I did read one of his short stories with my partner. It's um, the one about teleportation. Um, it's forever in there, I think is, is the line. Um, I in it the ending was so Oh it is like, the, okay. Yeah, the jaunt. Yeah. Yeah. The jaunt, yeah, that's it. Yeah. The the ending was just so like I just kind of like sat there with like my stomach in my mouth, just kind of like I I didn't you know like I was so incredibly disturbed by that story. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's and I think sometimes what I personally love about King and to bring it back to Christine like what I love about this book and this movie is just kind of the way he's able to capture things that sometimes it's like I don't know how to put into words and I've never heard or read or seen somebody capture of like these feelings quite like he does mm. I think that he's so observant and he like it's something that I just think is so cool about King is that he can just see something, just a normal everyday thing. And he'll be like, huh, but what if that's and something that kind of goes from there? <laughs> yeah. That's something that fascinates me is like listening to him talk about where his ideas for stories come from. Right. Like the forward to Salem's lot where he talks about how he was an English teacher teaching um, Dracula and he, his wife asked him what would happen if Dracula came to America 
And he's like, oh, well, he'd get hit by a car going through Times Square and just kind of like laughed it off and then actually thought about it and built yeah. Salem's Lot around that whole notion. And so that book is, Dra- is Dracula in small town America, which is, mm-hmm. again, an incredibly fascinating concept. This one, he got the idea because he was driving his car and as he pulled into his driveway, the odometer flipped to 100,000 miles or whatever. And he he was like, huh. What if the odometer ran backwards? And that was well, just what, where yeah. that idea came from. Like, yeah, like that that happened in my car and like those older cars, like you see that in Christine, how it has like 93,000 miles. And mm-hmm. what happens is when it hits 100,000, it goes back to zero. Mm. And like that happened in my car too. And so it's like, yeah, it just all of a sudden, it's like it just resets. Hmm. And now it's like it's starting over. It's like a fresh start. Like, does it have 100,000 miles or, you know, to, you know, two miles or six miles. Like it's, it's right. just, it's just like one of those interesting things. Or 400,000 miles. Yeah. It's like, you don't know. It's like mm. not actually very accurate. No, so, not at all. For whatever reason, I'm not sure what the logic, maybe they just never expected people to drive a hundred thousand. I don't know why they did that, but it seems short. I mean, well, who's, who's going to spend their entire life in a car, please. Those were, those things were made for Sunday drives at most, right? Like, I guess. Yeah. I mean, who's who's driving cross country in the 1950s, really? Well, I mean, that's like all like Route 66, right? Like you got like the open road, and that's the appeal, right? That's a different kind of different kind of America. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I and I guess it just kind of depends on where you're at, where you're from, and what you're. Uh, I mean, because yeah, again, I'm, because now I'm, now I'm thinking Kerouac. Yeah, that Kerouac is pure 50s, and that's exactly what Kerouac did. Just hitching across the country with whoever happened to pop up. So yeah, I guess yeah, I live I in the, I live in the West. So it's just kind of like, that's the appeal out here, right? Is that you can just get in your car and drive and where you're going, who knows, who cares, but you're going to go somewhere and like, you can just right. go North and you're going to head in the mountains. You can go South and go to the desert. Yeah. Whereas I'm in the Midwest. And so, you know, you just, you drive 45 minutes to get to work one way. So yeah, well, that's gross. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ah, that's that's life. <laughs> I, I I actually have worked jobs where I've had to drive forty five minutes to get into work one way. So Ooh, yeah, see, that's not the kind of driving that I. No, that's not a fan. I'm not a fan of that. But I don't I think, blame you. And I think that I just think that that's such a like the appeal of having a car like Arnie, like mm-hmm. Dennis. And like myself, like when you're a teenager and something that I think, I think, well, I think like you were saying in certain areas, if you live in an area where driving is a necessity or public transportation, it's not quite up to snuff. The Mm -hmm. appeal and the freedom that having a car brings Mm -hmm. and just like that independence and that stage of life when like that first big purchase, that first big investment, that first big commitment, it's like, right. I just find it so romantic. It's <laughs> like I find this movie so like romantic in a lot of ways in the story, that, which I know is weird. But. I was gonna say that's that's a I mean not the word I would pick. You picked it earlier, and I was like, "There's a story there," and I know we're gonna get into it. Um, but like, I mean, for me, I was never in a hurry to drive personally, Mm -hmm. um, because I had the best friends in the world and they all got their driver's license the second they turned 16 and they were, they all wanted to hang out with me for some reason. So they'd come pick me up and we just go places. Um, so I never had to like, look very far for a ride anywhere. So I didn't get my driver's license until I was 19 and like the Mm. day before my sophomore year of college, um, I got it, I got it. 10 minutes before my little sister, because my mom knew that if she got her license first, she would lord it over me for all of time. And she would have <laughs> rightly so. Yeah. Um, but like I, same day, I, I, same day as my little sister, we both got our licenses on the same day. Cause I just was not in a big hurry to get it. Like I just, it was just kind of like, Oh, I guess I should probably do this then. Huh? Um, but oh, you yeah, know, I now, wait. well, and see, yeah, that's it. But I was also like a very, and I've talked about this on the show before, a very sheltered, very conservative from a very conservative churched family. Like I was not the kind of kid looking for independence or looking to get into trouble or looking to stretch my you know wings and fly away. That was not who I was. Yeah. I was happy in my little cage. Thank you. Um, so like 
as I got older and realized, oh, I can, I can like get away with stuff now. Like that, that the, the appeal, but that would have never occurred to me at 16 because I was a very, I was a very good kid. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I think that, that yeah, probably I, speaks volumes about me, but yeah, there you go. <laughs> Cause I lived in like, we had like a slightly rural, um, part of town at that time. It's grown a lot in the last you know, 20 years. But at the time it was like, it felt like we were living out in the middle of nowhere. And so right. to get anywhere to do anything, I had to drive. Like public transportation was not a thing where we were. Uber was not a thing. Lyft was not a thing. Right. Like, and so like, yeah, I could borrow my parents' car maybe, but you mm-hmm. know, had they had other things going on. So that didn't always work. And so by like purchasing my car, like that was like, freedom and because you're a teenager like those choices matter and so it's like oh i'm gonna make a statement with my car like i'm not gonna get like some honda civic like i'm not gonna get like i want a cool car (laughs) so i'm getting my own grease lightning (laughs) i was gonna say it sounds like you you did get that which is i mean but i think I think your experience is probably a more prototypical teenage experience in that, you know, you want the car, you want the freedom, you want the expression of a car. For me, a car has always been a necessity and my, my view on it has always been very utilitarian. Can it get me from point A to point B? Great. Then it works. Oh, Um, see, yeah. See that I will say was the downfall of getting a, um, you know, a (laughs) antique classic car Right, is that. It was definitely not very reliable. And ultimately, that's why I, I sold it. I mm. actually I actually sold it twice and bought it twice I because I had it for a really long time. And then I moved out of state and was like, well, maybe this is the time. So I sold it and then um, ended up coming back home a few like a couple years later. And at one point, a little bit before that, my dad found out that the people we sold it to actually were selling it again because the engine threw a rod and so it was a lot of work to like yeah it it needs a new engine and so they were selling it so i bought it back (laughs) and then put a new engine in it and did all of that and then had it for a really long time and it was my daily driver um and then at another point i bought another car just so i had something that was actually a bit more reliable sure and then and then ultimately it was just like okay this is um a little bit more maintenance this is not very practical and that, right. you know, when you're not necessarily, you know, struggling <laughs> in your like, late 20s to pay bills, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, this is probably not very practical. Um, so I ended up selling it to, you know, a stereotypical older white guy with disposable who, yeah. income <laughs> who yep. could actually do all, all of the things that I had always mm-hmm. wanted to do and take it that final across the finish line thing. But yeah, sometimes... You just, you don't always want the practical thing. You just, the heart wants, just like Artie, man, the heart wants what the heart, heart wants. wants. what the heart wants. <laughs> My first car was a, I don't even know what color it was. It was like somewhere between purple and brown, a Toyota Camry hatchback station wagon. Mm-hmm. And it was called Chewbacca because whenever you opened the hatch on the back, it would make a <laughs> <laughs> kind of sound. Yeah. Um. And I, I drove, I, and that's the, my, my story with all of my cars. I drive them until they break. Yeah. And then I only get a new one when I am forced to get a new one. Like once I yeah. cannot drive the previous car anymore, then I start looking for a new one. That's, that was honestly the case. Like it sounds really silly, like stating it out loud, but like, so after I sold it for the final time, and this was probably like 10 years ago. Like I I was like a little bit like heartbroken over it because I felt Mm. like I had like sold out a little bit like, oh, I gave up kind of thing. Like, oh, now I just have like and I just had boring cars. I was like, all right, I'm just getting a Volvo. Okay, (laughs) I'm just getting, you know, like just something. I was like, I don't even care. I took like my sister, like my sister, like gave me like her old Passat. I was like, whatever, I don't fucking care. Like, just give me, it's just a car. I don't even care. You know, the I was way like, you so said bitter. Volvo just sounded like I a just, piece of your soul was dying. I was so, exactly. I was so bitter and it was just like, I don't care. It's just a car. I don't even care about it, whatever. And I would just, yeah, drive them into the ground. Mm-hmm. And I will say it's not until I got my most recent car and it was like, oh, I can love again. 
I got. <laughs> but it was also reliable. Like I, I have, a, I currently have like a Subaru, a WRX, and it was like, oh, I can, I can have something that's fun that I love, and is also like starts in the winter. <laughs> you, you found your balance. That's good. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a sixty-year-old antique. <laughs> right. Right. There's a middle ground. <laughs> And you found it. Congratulations. Thank That's you. not always easy to do. Yeah. Uh, we are 40 minutes into the shindig. So let's go ahead and get into the plot of this mofo. Um, for those joining us, this is uh, the plot in 60 seconds. This is the part of the show where we discuss the plot of 1983's Christine. And we do that in 60 seconds or less. Now, typically, that would be decided by the uh, either the coin of justice the canadian quarter of indifference or the d6 of destiny however we have a guest and so we have asked rachel if she would be so kind and she has graciously accepted the invitation to attempt the plot in 60 seconds so i've got 60 seconds on the clock right here i will give you the 30 and 10 second warnings and i will go ahead and start the time whenever you start the plot okay all right. Once upon a time, there was a teenage boy named Arnie Cunningham. He was a bit of a loser with a bully problem and only one real friend named Dennis. That was, however, until he met Christine. While driving home from school one day, Arnie caught a glimpse of a beautiful 1958 Plymouth Fury with a for sale sign in the window. Sure, she was a bit haggard and had a bit of a past, but it's only because she wasn't being appreciated properly. Against the wishes of Dennis and his parents, Arnie bought Christine and their tragic love story officially began. For the first time, Arnie found someone or something who truly appreciated him and that love allowed him to blossom. Yes, it only made him a bit aggro. Uh, but thirty whatever. seconds. She loved him. This new confidence even allowed him to snag the most beautiful girl in school. Soon, however, Christine's true colors began to show. She would do anything to protect Arnie and their love, even kill. As the bodies and close calls begin to pile up, Christine and Arnie spiral further into the darkness and their commitment to each other. Friends, family, who needs them when you have a love like this? Ten. Then, like so many star-crossed lovers, Arnie makes the ultimate sacrifice as an effort to save Christine from his meddling friends and pays for this love with his life. Christine, of course, returns the favor. Ah, true love. And that is time. Brilliant. <laughs> well <laughs> done, Rachel. Brava. <gasps> Nicely done. No, you nailed it. Well done. I know that was a bit of a... Uh you know, interpretation, but that's no. how I see it. <laughs> You've got a take and I love that. Let's actually, let's go ahead and start there. Like, so this for you, you, and again, you've kind of brought this up a few times, like the room, like the, the way that you have, and it, whether it's that you saw it as a child, but like you kind of romanticize this movie. I'd love to, to crack into that a little more. Like, I mean, because this is, I mean, if, if, I would say if this is a love story, it's an incredibly tragic, dark, yeah. dare I say, toxic love story. Like what I mean, but but you you romanticize this. So I'm I'm kind of curious, like um if I can put this as bluntly as possible, why? Yeah. <laughs> so I think what I find romantic when I'm looking at the story, just like Arnie and this car in finding something that you can like love and you find purpose in and you find a sense of identity and freedom in like I, I I had that with my car and like I remember the way it feels I remember the way it smells and like the freedom of like driving it at night with the windows down and listening to music and just like how it felt like 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 part of my identity and like part mm. of my personality and not in like oh i'm gonna make this my entire personality not like that kind of thing but just like you know when you're young and just figuring out who you are and finding that in a car and i think that that's what's attracted to me to the story and what i see in arnie because i just haven't really seen that relationship portrayed this way and it's the same kind of thing that i liked about greece too and mm. just I, you know, I love car movies in general, and I think you do see that in some other car movies, but I think it's just a little bit more um, sensual in some ways, but also innocent, if that makes sense. I know those are two weird ways to pair it together, but just kind of that youthful attraction to that idea of car and independence. Um, and then I also just think that the way that this movie is filmed, I find it to be just so gorgeous. And I mean, that moment where he's in the garage and says show me and she like like that's such a sexy scene like it I'm is sorry like it no, is you're so not wrong. sexy and even the way he says 
show me. I'm yeah. like, holy shit, this is about to get NC-17. Like, this is about to get illicit. Like, yeah. just based on the way he delivers that line, it, it's yeah. sexy as hell. Yeah. And, and, and it's impossible, I think, not to just, in, you know, make those connections because he's a boy and her name's Christine. And obviously, you know, like there's that dynamic between them, you know, the subtext she, becomes the text at some point. Yeah, yeah. Like, would she do that with a female, you know, driver? Who knows? That's a movie I would love to see. Um, but it would be a great sequel for this. Honestly, I, I, that's my, that's my pitch. I, if when they, when they remake it, cause I'm sure they will. It's like, it doesn't have to be a dude. Mm-mm. Um, but I, I think that that's what I just find romantic about it, too, is just the way it's filmed, the way Carpenter interprets this story. I also think it just looks great. And I, I had just never seen like the like the scene where the gas station and Christine just plows through all the bullies and then she's chasing Buddy Repperton down the street and just like the mm. patience and seeing the car that way. I think is just mm-hmm. so cool because Christine is not a typical like muscle car, right? Mm-mm. Under the hood she is, but that's a, a a little bit of a muscle car for the time period, but that's a whole other thing. But you see like <laughs> Dennis's car, which is a charger, which is like a muscle car. I mean, that's what, you know, Dom Toretto drives. Like it's like, right. that's like a tough car. Right. But Christine is this weird this fury which is you know kind of like the bel air and it's just it's not that kind of car that you think of when you think like tough guy or like that car is badass you know right. that's not what not necessarily what you think of and which so which is part of the reason why king picked it right oh uh, well i i mean i've always thought and this is what my dad thought like that people always romanticize and dream about or want to obtain the car that they thought was cool in high school so whatever that car was, when you were in high school, whatever you thought was the baddest car out there, that's mm-hmm. what you're always going to like dream about. And so maybe this is what King thought was really cool when he was in high school. You know, like it was still older at that time. But like, sure. you know, maybe he's just a car that he always thought was cool. And we see cars from this period like pop up in a lot of his work, like in from a Buick eight, it's a very similar car mm-hmm. in 11, 22, 63. It's a very yeah. similar car. So I think that there's something about this era of cars that King just likes. And it makes sense because it would have been around him at that age where he right. thought that they were cool and affordable because they're a little bit older. Like, you know, at this time, I mean, obviously like 58, this movie is it's a 20 year old car. It's technically an antique and same thing. Mm. Like Dennis's charger is already 10 years old. So uh, they're cool, but they're not new cars. And so I, yeah, I can't even remember where I was going with all of that, but I, I just love the way it's, the car is made to be badass in this movie. And I think that's what I also really like about it. Cause Carpenter makes this car look so cool and sound so cool. And I'm just not used to seeing this era of cars put forth that way. Usually it's like 60s and 70s era muscle cars, not this right. big boat of a car with these like huge wings. <laughs> I love the personality that he infuses into the car just by virtue of the filmmaking. The yeah. way he shoots it, like the way, like the the initial scene, like the Christine is born evil scene, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, where the guy is just he's got his hand in under the hood while he checks something in the in the front grill, and you you they zoom in on his hand, and then you get a shot of the of the 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 hood up, and then it just slams down, and you cut to the guy screaming like you it's a car so it has no emotion whatsoever but you absolutely know just it from that from those that series of shots you know Mm -hmm. exactly what the car is thinking in that moment like i'm gonna crush this motherfucker's hand well yeah how dare him they don't even know each other and he's like grabbing around under her hood like excuse Mm -hmm. me sir i'm a lady (laughs) would chop his hand off too (laughs) But like they're just, and again, just the, the this, this car has absolutely no thought process whatsoever, yeah. but you're watching this movie and you know exactly what this car is thinking at any given moment. And that is, that is all thanks to Carpenter and his DP. Like that is, 
that is some filmmaking 101 stuff right there. And that's exactly the reason why I think it works to the degree that it does. Well, in the clever way that they use the music, because like in the music is mm. part of the book, but the way Carpenter utilizes that to kind of be Christine's voice. Mm hmm. It's just something like that so Michael Bay would steal for Bumblebee and Transformers many years later. Yeah, like using like because whatever the lyrics are saying, that's kind of like how she's communicating outside of the actual physical actions that she's, right. you know, doing and like the movements and, you know, whatever. And so I think that's just like such a brilliant way to do that because and I think that's something, too, that I just find kind of romantic and I like about this film because you know, when you're like little and you're like assigning personalities to inanimate objects, or, you know, like your stuffed animals and things. And you're like, oh, I, I have to like rotate which stuffed animal I bring to bed because I don't want the other ones to get upset. Maybe that's you just. You don't want them to feel bad. I don't know. Yeah. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, no, I, I just slept with all of mine. That was how I avoided right? that. Yeah. You know, but I think that's like it's in some ways it's like an extension of that where that I find romantic that like oh, this car actually, like, can feel how much I care about it. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like, it's not even like an animal or something. But I think that that's kind of like a remnant of like a childhood thing where you're like, oh, I just, I want them to know how much I love them and feel it. And that's the same thing, <laughs> I feel like, I guess. D did you think this was, based on this movie, did you think this was what high school was going to be like for you when you got to high school? Like, I know, like, I would watch stuff as a kid, like Saved by the Bell and think, oh, well, that's what high school is going to be like. Like, oh, did, yeah. did Christine like and Grace like influence your idea of what high school was going to be? Uh, Well, yes, it did in, in, in some ways. And I think in some ways it it did. Like, it, I, I felt like that kind of came true in in certain ways. Like, I do love. And that's part of like the car and the freedom to be able to like go to a concert with my friends or go to, you know, some sort of event with them and that kind of stuff like that part. But I never, I don't know, we didn't look as cool. <laughs> I certainly <laughs> did not look as cool as any of these people. <laughs> Even Lee, wow. like I know she made some fashion, like questionable fashion choices, but like her hair is amazing in every scene and my hair never looked that good. <laughs> I mean, it's 1983. One could argue most fashion choices were questionable in the 80s. Yeah. Um, no, I I mean, you, you were talking about kind of the the early love story of it. Like, I know Keith Gordon said that he, whenever he would touch the car, he, as an actor, had to like imagine that it was a woman and had to imagine yeah. what part of the woman he was touching whenever he touched a part of the car like mm -hmm. to kind of imbue his performance with that. And given how he looks at the beginning of this film versus the change that comes over him once he begins driving Christine, he goes from like this very awkward virginal teenager to this very confident individual. And the implicate, again, the subtext is almost, yes, I've had sex and now I am, I've become a man. I am now to be respected. And yeah. you see that in a lot of his behavior. Like it, again, it's all subtext, but it's absolutely there. Like, mm -hmm. which I find really fascinating. And I think Gordon, for someone who didn't really do a lot of acting outside of this movie, basically became a director. Um, but I think his performance is absolutely incredible in this movie. Like I'm kind of bummed. We didn't get more Keith Gordon performances, honestly. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I really like his, his uh transformation i guess like he's so dorky at the beginning and mm -hmm. so sad and pathetic and i think that it's interesting because i i do think a lot of it we see through dennis's eyes because it's not like we're charting right we do, we're, we're following him around but it's almost like we're kind of observing it in bits of pieces from dennis as you know his friend who's seen him forever and it's just kind of like he just shows up at least for the first like act i think we're definitely looking yeah. at it through dennis's eyes for sure and it's just like you're not quite sure what's going on and why he's doing this and it's like you know he's still friends with dennis like mm -hmm. he still shows up like there's still bits and pieces and it's just like wait how much original arnie is still left in there 
Right. And, and it's interesting to kind of follow that until you realize that like, oh no, like Arnie's gone. Yeah. Like he's been, and that's at like those final moments in the movie where we see like him in the car and stuff. It's like, oh no, he's, yeah, he's gone. Like Christine he's has gone. Christine has taken over all you know everything there's there's no there's no arnie left right. and that's what's so sad and that's the tragic part of this is he just went, went too hard for the wrong gal <laughs> yeah that, that codependence just never pays off right yeah um yeah I mean, and again i they have it's it's almost like a sid and nancy kind of relationship arnie and christine really like yeah. it's really toxic for both of them neither one of them is profit profiting off of this thing mm -hmm. but it just like and it ends up destroying both of them obviously yeah. christine will live again but um arnie tragically will not well yeah yeah i think sid and nancy is a good comparison because the thing is like you can see what's attractive about christine and mm -hmm. what she's able to offer arnie like that attraction makes sense like, even though it doesn't make sense to anybody else around Arnie, like, why would you like this car? Why right. would you? But he sees the potential in it. He sees something in her. You know, he sees what she could be just with a little investment in time. And then, you know, what that can turn into. But then ultimately, yeah, Christine just like sucks. <sighs> That 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 same thing that he found attractive about her at the beginning, just like you said, like Nancy, it's like, oh, ultimately, yeah, that's just going to be your downfall. That's like not sustainable, yeah. and you're giving up too much of yourself to this thing. <laughs> exactly, and and in that way, it almost seems Faustian. Like there's there's almost a Faustian bargain here. Like he's he's traded his soul for for whatever it is that Christine's offering. I also was getting. And this, I'm showing my references. I'm showing my hand here a little bit when I say this, but it's it's also giving um, Little Shop of Horrors mm -hmm. um, a bit as well. Like you, you know, it offers you everything, yeah. and what does it ask? Well, just 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 blood. That's all. It doesn't have yeah. to be yours. Um, you know, what unspeakable things are you willing to do to get what you want? It mm -hmm. is really, and and, the, and again, that's incredibly Faustian. Um, like that that's the whole note like i'll give you yeah i'll give you an eternal life i'll i just no, your, your soul you won't miss it it's fine like mm -hmm. and that's that's very much i think what both in a much more absurd way little shot but in a much more serious way christine i think both of those kind of have that weird through line of that kind of faustian bargain within them which i find again really interesting yeah and you know christine i mean not to get it twisted it's like i fully understand christine is just she's just born bad she's just evil mm, <laughs> like right. she's just straight up but how like sexy and how alluring that can be right and i mean obviously that's a, a tale as old as time mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the, the attraction to the dark side and how yeah. enticing it can be at first but ultimately that's you know it's gonna suck you down and it's gonna take you with it like the you you can only go so far with that and right that's what we she's see here she's the femme fatale really when you get right down yes. to it christine yeah. is the femme fatale like she is her ex she exists to cause our hero to stumble and fall and to try to drag him down uh drag him down with her really and in mm -hmm. this case because we're not under the haze code anymore she succeeds yeah oh i love it um and I do think, I think it was smart to do that because in the book, obviously there's like a whole ghost involved and like, that's great in the book. And I think it makes sense. And I do like that part of the story. Um, but I think it was really smart to just like leave it ambiguous and just like sure strip that. that part away for the film. Sure Number one, just because it. that's hard to like, I think not hard, but uh, you to put that on film. It would be some extra. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot of lore that you don't yeah. need to tell the story mm -hmm. it, it, it that feels like one of those things that you know king felt like he needed an explanation and so he kind of plotted and wrote this whole thing out and i think that again I, like you said i think that works on paper but on screen it's much more direct and that opening scene does it perfectly look it's just a bad car 
yeah. the yeah. car's just evil. That what mm-hmm. what else do you want from me? It's a it's an evil car. Just get yeah. on board with that, and we're gonna have a good time. Mm-hmm. And we did. Like I think yeah. I think that that is an absolutely incredible decision. I think it works really well, and I think it really helps this movie. And it 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 becomes instead of Arnie being possessed by like the spirit of the car's previous owner, as he is in the book, right. he's basically become possessed of just like Christine's ideal of what, Mm -hmm. you know, her maybe perhaps her ideal or original owner might have been like, he's, he's making these much like Sandy does at the end of Greece. He's making these changes for the person he loves to become someone that they want to be with. Yeah. It's just that, you know, obsession is great in some ways, right? Like we're all obsessed. We're obsessed with films, you know, we're obsessed with horror, we're obsessed with all these things, but it doesn't matter what your obsession is, you take it too far. Right. And uh, it's going to be your downfall, right? Everything in moderation. And (laughs) yes, very, a very wise sentiment that honestly, Arnie probably should have listened to. (laughs) He should have listened to, but it's hard to do when you have some supernatural entity just casting a spell over you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Uh, What are some other differences between the book and the, um, some other differences between the book and the film? Well, some of the deaths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the way the deaths unfold are a little bit different. Who dies is a little different. Um, Like Harry Dean Stanton's character dies in the book but not the movie and you know but i I, everything like it's i don't i don't feel like there's any major i mean the major change is the idea about the ghost like okay like that's the major change other than that it's all kind of like some small character things some of the characters get condensed um Mm. in the movie you know like okay we're just gonna put these two characters together just because why do we need this other, you know, we don't need to go down that road or explain that. Like, let's just boil them into this character. Um, So I think those are just like the main, the main differences. It's funny because I think that this is a movie that is known for like, Oh, they made all these changes from the book. But when you read the book, it's like, uh, there's a lot of stuff that it's like beat for beat out of the book. So it's like, it still feels very true to me. It is one of the best King adaptations. I will okay. say that. All right. Right on. I, I just look- I, I just I feel like it captures the spirit of the book. I feel like it captures the spirit of King, mm-hmm. but it also captures the spirit of like Carpenter too, I feel like. Like yeah. to me, this looks and feels like a Carpenter film. And it sounds mm-hmm. like a Carpenter film. And so it's like that perfect blend of filmmaker and King, where it's mm-hmm. like, okay this person gets it and is able to capture both of those things without losing the full identity or leaning too hard one way or the other, because we've seen that somebody leans too far one way and we get the shining. And then somebody, which is still an incredible film. It's just not a very good adaptation. Right. And then somebody leans too far the other way and we get the shining, the other adaptation, (laughs) the Mick Garris (laughs) shining. Yes. Bless (laughs) Mick Garris's sweet, sweet heart. But sometimes it's like, when you're mm. too married to the, the you know, the yeah. original source material doesn't necessarily translate to screen the same way that it does on the page, right? At so. that point, it's not an adaptation. You're just putting the book on on screen and that's, there, there's no, yeah, edit, there's no skill in that. Well, there's a skill, but it also like, they're different mediums. Like that doesn't always work that way. Like what works on screen is not always necessarily what works best on the page and vice versa. And so I think this is like a perfect middle ground for that. And I I just don't think, I don't know. It gets credit for that. I think people, there's a lot of people that I think, I don't think that's a hot take. I think that's a pretty normal take. (laughs) Well, I think I, I read somewhere that King himself considers this adaptation boring um like he he's like well i would rather it be bad than boring like yeah i don't think king was particularly impressed with this with this adaptation from what i've read that's that's silly i (laughs) i really don't know you guys like it just i this is one of those things that i just 
Like, there's a lot of times when people are like, oh, I'm not really into it. I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, I can see that. I can understand. I don't get that here. I don't understand. Like, my brain can't process it. And I know I'm too close to it. I know this is a me thing. But you recognize that. And that's, that's, (laughs) that's fine. You recognize it. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tucker, we know that your, your power box got hit by a 58, a red 58 Plymouth Fury. So <laughs> you've been, you've been kind of quiet for a while, but you're back. You guys, I'm back. My power went out. I'm having a winter storm or something. Oh, no. There's like snow and rain and wind. And I live in a very rural area. So my power goes out a lot. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. But hey, I went outside. And it's so dark. <laughs> like, I cannot believe how dark it is outside. Because, like, nobody's house lights are on. Like, the campground lights aren't on. It's You guys not have generators really on the dark. campground? Uh, we do for the store in the office. But it only keeps, like, the uh, essential stuff going. Mm, okay. Yeah. And apparently your, your living quarters are not essential? My house is not essential, man. <laughs> Well, that's a bummer. We've been having a good, a good old time talking about uh, Christine. Uh, do you have any thoughts on adaptation at all, Tucker? That's kind of what we've been talking about just uh, most recently. This this specific adaptation, yeah. Um, I think I think it's good. Uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to come right back into this. You know? I know. Um, <laughs> okay. I, well, I. Uh, Nope, keep going. Sorry. I was going to say <laughs> it, it's good. I think I think it gets the, you know, the broad strokes, the tone of the book is the same. I mean, I'm sure you guys discussed the differences already, but I don't think any of those really separates it too much from its source material. I think it's a pretty a pretty solid adaptation. And like we talked about uh specifically with remakes like with the the remake of robocop uh it's 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 kind of like that in a way to where you have to adapt the material for a different medium you know and uh i think i think the the choices that were made that were different than the book are pretty solid i think it makes for a better film yeah i I am curious generic thing i could have said no no no. (laughs) i but i also wanted to ask you because you said like it doesn't necessarily feel very like carpenter or like signature carpenter to you and i was yeah can you talk a little i'm just curious because like i said what what about it what why why do you think it is that this is the film that you forget carpenter directs i think it's just that there's not a lot of uh, like i said before there's bits and pieces of him, him in it like if you've seen his other films You'll be like, oh, that's some shit John Carpenter does. But like as a whole, it doesn't have uh, the overall feeling of it doesn't feel as much like a Carpenter film as stuff like In the Mouth of Madness or, uh, you know, Halloween even. Mm. I think it I think it's missing some of his acerbicness, if 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 that's the right word or acerbicity. I don't know what the word is. Um, what the noun form of acerbic is, but like that kind of energy that he usually brings to things like the thing that speaks to me as being the most carpenter is the disillusionment with the nostalgia, which is why I think Mm -hmm. I I said the, the, the idea of the weaponized nostalgia in this movie, which I, I think, and he gets into this, I think a lot more in they live, but the idea that Reagan was using this kind of, 40s and 50s era nostalgia to weaponize the conservative base and it worked so well that he got elected to two terms and probably could have gotten a third if they hadn't made it law that he couldn't um like he uh, he just weaponized that to such a degree and carpenter of course is extremely anti-reagan and extremely like progressive and forward-thinking filmmaker that i think those ideas although subtle and not as overt like, but you get the idea, like as Arnie kind of regresses into this fifties thing, you get like the fifties rock music coming through Christine stereo. We talked a little bit about that. Like all the things that the radio is singing are the things that she's thinking. But, and I mean, I grew up on those oldies, so I 
I fucking love the soundtrack of this movie. It's absolutely incredible. Um, but like those elements that you almost feel like when Alexandra Paul delivers that final line of the movie, God, I hate rock and roll. You're almost like, I feel like that's Carpenter on some level, just being like, God, I hate this shit. But I mean, like, yeah. And it's the idea about romanticizing a period of time, right? That like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, it might have been this kind of ideal life or ideal image of America, but but for whom, <laughs> right? Like, like that was not necessarily the experience for everybody. It was a very right. privileged, select group of people that had kind of that idea. When we think of the 50s, yes. that was not the experience for everybody and there was a lot of things not great about that era and so there is a danger in romanticizing and getting obsessed with that idea and i mean that's something we're still struggling with right that is the entirety of the maga movement absolutely like it's literally what the phrase means it's like Mm -hmm. like what like what was so great about that you know like there's, there's a real danger in becoming obsessed with that and whether you know if arnie is america right you're gonna lose part of your soul and if you get too obsessed with it ultimately it's going to be your downfall because it's just gonna take you over and ultimately like destroy you from the inside out and it's just i think that that's such an interest and i do see a lot of carpenter in that because obviously we've seen him explore that a lot and i do think I just don't know if he feels job. as free to explore that here totally. as he would in later films. Hundred percent, and I think that is, you know, with King, and I think that he knew coming off like a different approach to this. This wasn't a passion project necessarily. This right. was a for hire thing. It doesn't feel like he phones it in. I f- I feel like he commits to it mm-hmm. and like does a good job at it. But yeah, I think he was looking at it differently. And I mean, can you blame the guy? Like. Uh, who no. who wants to get like beat up like that like it would be hard to put something else back out there and like to trust your own gut and to trust your own instincts and to like have the same kind of confidence that he did in some of those earlier things and then it just gets like shot down by audiences and critics right like that's got to be so right. frustrating which it's funny because obviously we've seen how things have been evaluated and reappraised and like actually mm-hmm. appreciated because they are brilliant and it's not that they were right but at the time that has mm-hmm. to feel just like so demoralizing <laughs> and that's why his attitude now is pretty much like okay cool give me money yeah like oh yeah like oh you you love my films why didn't you go see them when they were first run in theaters like yeah. pay me <laughs> like yeah. and i get it the man got kicked around and was basically disallowed from doing what he wanted to wanted to and loved to and needed to do mm-hmm. and uh he's understandably bitter about it and now he just wants to play video games and smoke weed and i wish him all the best in doing that yeah i i do think that he was a good choice for this though because i also think that his like horror leanings and horror chops came in really handy because i think christine the way she's filmed and the way we see her kind of like stalking Moochie and Buddy and mm-hmm. like these bullies, like it's very Jaws like too, right? It is. And yeah. just like how she's filmed and like that stealthy, like that tension that we get. I think that somebody, especially somebody who has experience with something like Halloween, <laughs> like that experience, I think is part of what I love about it is just how we see Christine kind of like just hanging back a little bit. And, you know, when she's stalking all of these people, I think is perfect. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's very slashery. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure that's necessarily how somebody else would have interpreted that. Uh, but I think that he executes that so well. I love it. Agreed. Well, I don't, I don't think that the fact that this doesn't feel as Carpenter to me as some of his other films makes this bad or any worse. Yeah. Than those films. Uh, I still think it's a phenomenal film. I think with this movie, he didn't really have to. He didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Because it's already, it's kind of all there in the script. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. And uh, one thing that I love about this film is that this comes on the heels 
of stuff like Happy Days and mm-hmm. American Graffiti. Yep. Uh, and it's kind of one of the first stories, novels, or films to kind of turn that on its head. And that's something I wanted to say about five minutes ago, but like we moved past it. So <laughs> no, by all, look, I dude. really needed to throw that in there. No, I think no, that- I, I completely agree with you on that point. Like, no, that's that's a hundred percent on the money, absolutely. Which I think is really funny because, like, pairing this with like something like Greece, which we also see, like, some interesting ties, you know, and like, you know, some weird, like Kelly Preston's in this movie, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, in the shot where the he's right on top of the hood, that's yeah, I mean, that's right from Greece. That is, yeah. yeah. Well, and the dude looks like John Travolta. Kelly Preston. Yeah, he married. really does. He Kelly, does. Preston, he does. <laughs> Kelly Preston married to John Travolta. Right. And just like like so yeah. many kind of interesting comparisons. Yeah, like we were saying earlier, like Arnie kind of transforming <laughs> into like this mm-hmm. greaser is kind of like Sandy a little bit. Like, oh, this is what you want me to be. Like, this is who I am now. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Cha- changing for this thing that you love. It's just. I can change for you. Yeah. I can be what you want me and need me to be. You yeah, know, at the expense of my own sense of self and identity. Yeah, it's just so funny, this weird, like, cyclical obsession. I mean, we see this with multiple different decades, but it's yeah. like, I mean, obviously, Greece was, wait, wait, what year did Greece come out? It was later, right? It was like 78, I yeah. think. It was, oh, was when it? Well, I think, oh, I th- aren't they watching it in this movie? Like, aren't, does, no. does, are they not? I did I, no. did I miss seeing that? Okay, never mind. I'll say because that's about when this movie takes place, though late seventies. So yeah, so I think there is like there is definitely some things there, like you were saying, like a response to that, to mm-hmm. that, like flipping it, it's on it on its head a little bit, and just kind of yeah, exploring the underbelly of that, like you were saying, like in a in a way that's not so obnoxiously preachy or so it's, it's like it's just there and obviously we can tear it apart and i i do think that that's very much a part of it and i think that that's very much something that king was thinking about as well um so yeah i don't know i think just carpenter was just a brilliant choice for this movie and I'm glad i think we need <laughs> i think we need someone to come in now and turn this you know wave of 80s 90s nostalgia and and turn it on its head and shake it up a little bit because you know the Duffer brothers have a lot to answer for is all I'm going to say. I, <laughs> you know what? I I don't know if they have a lot to answer for. I mean, can you blame them? It's like, well, I, I don't mean, blame them. No, I don't blame checks, them at all. Like... But no, no, 100%. But like, I just, you know, the kind of the wave of 80s nostalgia that Stranger Things kind of kicked off um, oh, yeah. to, to the extent that, you know, just about every movie getting made now is a a reboot or a retread or a reimagining or a remake of, of some 90, 80s or 90s property. And I'm just, you know. Isn't it wild how long that's last? Like, I feel like Stranger Things came out like a billion years ago. I mean, just and about, like, yeah. Like, why are we not past this? Like, I feel like that trend, it, like, it's just too long like it's been too well, long those kids are so old how how right are those kids are practically in their 50s now season. like but right? just yeah just the fact that the industry is still like remakes nostalgia like leaning into it's like that was 10 years ago you got can we like <laughs> find something else <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and the answer the short answer to that question rachel is no no we can't I know. Sorry. <laughs> i'm so sorry uh, uh. Is it just me or does this movie just feel like Dick Miller should be in it somewhere? I, I would put Dick Miller in this movie, sure. Like I, well, I, I just think every, Harry I, Dean well, Stanton is kind of the <laughs> He is. Or, or, or Robert Miller Prosky. Or Robert Prosky. <laughs> one of those two. And I honestly I don't want to recast either of them because I think they're both perfect and they're both wonderful. But I'm just like, you need like another like why can't the shop teacher be Dick Miller? The shop teacher should be Dick Miller. Oh, yeah. The shop teacher Oh, no, wait. Sorry. I got my movies mixed up. I've been preparing for uh, the Rage Carry 2 unenfranchised. <laughs> and a fact just tried to weasel its way into this movie. So uh, a, a non-factual never mind fact. That. Never mind that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> but no, like, yeah. Um, played by David Spielberg. Uh, Mr. Casey. Not related. The shop teacher. Yeah, I, not I, would, related. I would not guess so. But yeah. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I would, I would, Dick Miller should, should have been the shop teacher in this movie. I'm just going to, I'm going to, that's my, that's the flag I'm planting. I'm just going to go out on that. That's good note. What <laughs> if Donald Pleasance was in this movie? Oh, I don't know don't, who he would be, but I don't need room for his accent in this. It's too much Americana. You can't, you can't have Donald Pleasance in there. I shot the car six times. <laughs> <laughs> Like I yeah I like he's too, he's too fancy and yeah way British too or fancy. something to be well to be like Le Bay you know like we need somebody like oh more like Haggard, yeah like <laughs> I mean he could play Haggard he could he I mean we we all saw the end of um uh Escape from New York he can he can pull that off but yeah can he <laughs> I don't know I guess. It's... He's he's a talented actor. I think he could probably play it. Uh, no, but he's like too like he's too like proper. I'm not sure. But my I lights are like... flickering, you guys. Uh oh. Is Christine back? Oh, do you see that? I did. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. The house began to twitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm in a very fragile space right now, you guys. I, it's okay, man. Ooh. It's okay. You're you're for now. You're among friends. All right, good. Yeah, this is this can be a safe space right now. <laughs> this this is Encaster meeting right here. This is a safe space for all of us. <laughs> um, no judgment. As I said earlier, no judgment at this table. Um, what what else do we have? Uh, what else do we have about Christine, Rachel? What else? I mean, go off. What else you got? I mean, I really like John Stockwell. I like his character of Dennis. I think he does a really good job at like selling that friendship because that's a tough one. Like, oh yeah, mm. this like super popular jock is like friends with Arnie. But I think he does a decent, like a pretty decent job. I think of like, I get the feeling that like they've known each other since they were little kids. Yeah. Which I and think those... is something like, that's the thing I think that happens. Like as you get older and like you get in high school and you kind of like, you know, when you were seven, you were both, I mean, you're seven, but then, yeah. you know, as you get old, maybe you're the loser and your friend goes like the jock way. It's just like how people evolve. But mm -hmm. I, I just think it's really sweet to see a friendship like this represented in this way. Um, because especially like during this time period in the eighties, you know, jocks and nerds were always like pitted against each other. So it's kind of rare to see. There were whole a film friendship. franchises based around that idea. Like, yeah. So to see a friendship like this and like, not just like, Oh, we're friends, but like, I'm going to fight for you and I'm going to mm -hmm. call you out and like, I'm going to do what I can, you know, ultimately he fails. <laughs> right. <laughs> Try. <it. laughs> just, you know, part of that tragedy. I, and I, I like that notion. Like it, that speaks a lot to the character of Dennis that he has, maintained that friendship because how easy would it be for him it's so much simpler if he didn't have to like stand up for this guy in front of you know in front of buddy like if he mm -hmm. didn't have to like step in and save this kid's ass every day which you get the impression that he absolutely does yeah but he does it because they're friends not because of any sort of obligation he's he genuinely cares for this kid so like it's it, it's it's a touching thing to see and it's not a friendship that we see portrayed very often in film or in real life i guess well i guess the the closest tv equivalent i can think of is saved by the bell because mm. there's no way that all f six of those archetypes are hanging out every day it just doesn't it just doesn't happen but yeah yeah um i mean something that i think is just aged well and i think just people continue to appreciate too like the practical effects on this film mm -hmm like still just look so great <laughs> the the reconstruction scene i know exactly how they did it and i still ask how the fuck did they pull that off because it's just yeah. so well done it, yeah like, it yes i know so it's cool. plastic and yes they ran the film in reverse and yes they put like suction cups all over it and but like it just it it's so seamless like the way mm -hmm. the the way it's edited the way it's shot it it might be one of the best scenes in Carpenter's entire career. And that's saying something because that man has directed some incredible scenes. Like yeah. it's, it's just so good. It's so good. It looks really good. It's the same uh, effects guy as the thing. 
Uh, he was same guy. He was on. He wasn't the head guy because I think Rob Bottin was the head guy, but he was like on the FX team, if I'm not mistaken. I'm gonna look this up. And also, like, I mean, like the, I mean, when Christine's on fire, that's like, I mean, that's also like an iconic thing, and looks so cool. I, I mean, was thinking about that when I was watching it, and I came to the realization that if uh, that was done today, it would be CGI, and it kind of made me sad. Right? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. Because it looks dangerous. so good. And it's it dangerous. So good. It's a car. It's yeah. a car. That There's is... gasoline in there, you guys. <laughs> There's so many flammable fluids in there. <laughs> Match in the gas tank. Boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. Like, not not good. So no. the fact that they were able to pull it off. And yeah, I mean, as I'm sure we know, like, fire is very hard to, like, scale and do properly, like, in CGI. And so, like, yeah. there's just... You know, I just appreciate that they did it. And obviously it was a different time, so they had to do it that way. But yeah, God, that holds up so well. And it's an iconic image for good reason. Yes. The only effect that doesn't hold up well in this movie, and I don't know if it ever held up, was the dummy when christine is crashing into the gas station and one of uh homeboy's buddies yeah. the guy from ghostbusters yeah. when he gets squished like that dummy's just like that yeah it's <laughs> so, so obviously a dummy the looks, other i love it because there are campy moments in this movie right? oh yeah and and that to me kind of is one of them it adds some levity to because that's a pretty intense sequence and I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it adds some levity to it, kind of makes it all go down a little smoother. Yeah. There's also a thing that has always, like, not bugged me, but it's like, so when Christine kills Moochie in that, like, alley nook, right? Or that, like, delivery drop-off port, whatever. I mean, I think it's so cool how it's just, like, she just, like, forces her way in, like, Oh, it's so cool. Mm-hmm. But also, it's like, why didn't Moochie just jump onto the hood of the car? Correct. Well, because <laughs> there's a lot of standing in happen. front of the car. There's a lot of standing in front of the car as it comes towards yeah. you in this movie. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of it. <laughs> All right, so I want to clarify. I want to clarify real quick. Okay. Rob Bottin is the special effects, uh, the special makeup effects creator and designer on the thing. Special okay. effects foreman on the thing is a guy named Hal Bigger. Uh, but then Roy Arbogast is also on the special effects team. He's just credited as special effects. Mm. He is, however, credited as the special effects supervisor on another little film that came out uh, several weeks earlier in 1983 called, let me see if I'm saying this right, Return of the Jedi. Oh. Um, so, yeah, he Heard was the supervisor it? on that one. Yeah. Uh, coordinator the American on Graffiti Starman. guy made other movies, I guess. Yeah, oh. that's wild. <laughs> wild, dude. That's crazy. Who'd have thought? Not me. Wow. Damn. Christine, though. Good movie. Good movie. It though. is, you guys. I like it. Like it is it. good. It, it, it got raised a whole, a whole star ranking in my, in my <laughs> Butterbox review this time. So yeah. I didn't even remember it. So <laughs> I'm like, my review is it's more positive now than it would have been when I originally saw it. I think it's good. Yeah. Mine definitely, definitely was. Um, so this movie comes out on December 9th, 1983, just in time for Christmas. Uh, don't forget there is a scene set at Christmas. So Christine is a Christmas movie. Mm-hmm. Um, tell all your friends. Um, and the it opens in fourth place the weekend it comes out to 3.5. Four million dollars. Um, in number one is a little movie called Sudden Impact, also new this week. Uh, that is, is that the... is Jean Claude Van Damme or nope. Steven Seagal? Neither. That is Clint Eastwood and Dirty Harry. Oh yeah. Oh, Sudden Impact. Yes, that's Sudden. I think impact. it's sudden, sudden Death. Is that what we're thinking of? Probably. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, all the Dirty Harry movies, the the titles are all different. Sudden Death is John Claude Van Damme. That's what we are. I remember The Dead. The Deadpool is a Dirty Harry. Yep. 
Jim Carrey's in that. He's a rock star. Yeah. And then there's the other Deadpool, which is is definitely not that. Yeah. No. No. Not at all. <laughs> no. In second place, he has a little friend, and he'd like you to say hello. It's Scarface. Speaking of De Palma. Uh, that hey, one, that's that De Palma guy. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that De Palma guy. He, he made a carry. One, yeah. uh, in third sure. place, it's uh, down from number one the weekend before. I think it's been in theaters for three weeks up to this point. Uh, the eventual Best Picture winner for 1983, Terms of Endearment. A uh, little James L. Sure. Brooks joint there. Um and then fourth place, Christine. And in fifth place, uh, up from 18. So I'm guessing this is its wide release weekend. Uh, in f- uh, After having been out in limited release for four weekends, the Barbara Streisand film Yentl. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then rounding out the top 10, we've got uh, A Christmas Story at number six, The Big Chill at number seven. Uh, Ooh, never that's your boy. S- uh, Larry Kasdan, yeah. Uh, Never Say Never Again in eighth place, the Sean Connery Bond movie not by Eon. Uh, In ninth place, The Smurfs and the Magic Flute. And in tenth place, a little Tom Cruise film called All the Right Moves. Hmm. Christine would go on to rank as, I want to say, 66th film of the year. Um, earning a grand total in the year of its release of $11.7 million. It would go on to make, across all its theatrical runs, uh, it would go on to make $21,200 uh, and another 29000 international. So really not the box office draw, despite the fact that this uh, ending of this movie absolutely leaves it open for sequels. We don't ever see one. What um, was the budget, Stephen? The budget. I just closed that tab. You would ask I'm me that. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go. I thought it, it was included. <laughs> oh, um, battery's not included on this one. It looks oh, like, yeah. nope, nope, not seeing it. No budget. No, nope. that's the, amazing. They don't have it. They it, don't was, it looks great for no budget. Ten million. Okay. Ten. Okay. So then, with um, with um, produ- uh, with advertising and all that, marketing. They, yeah, yeah. Marketing. That's the word I'm looking for. They did not end up making that back for sure. Um, but yeah, the fifteen uh, percent of that budget, by the way, cars, just cars. I don't, yeah, I think they went just through just that like, one car. I think they went through 20, 20 cars and only yeah. like two survived. Yeah, that's what I read which, too. You no, know, makes sense. Which Absolutely. always like breaks my heart because I'm like, oh, oh, all those cars just. I, I mean, I know they probably aren't, weren't all in great shape to begin with, but so. yeah, they they had like um they had like a, a few that were like the show cars, like the ones where where she just the is looking cars. pretty or getting driven around, and then there's you know the ones for just like uh, like a, some of the more like. Re- scenes where that require a little more driving or a little more action. And then there's the ones where she's just getting the shit kicked out of her. And yeah. you know, those are the, those are the cars that like are barely hanging on, barely mm-hmm. run. We just need it for this shot kind of cars. So, yeah, I, this is such a, I, I love looking at this. We were talking about just like kind of the early King film adaptations and it is like, God, that that first run of films was just crazy. Yeah, Carrie, The Shining, Cujo, The Dead Zone, and then Christine. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just solid, and like yeah. I think that that's you know this just plays into that and just kind of showing everybody that like oh okay, now we got to make every King thing ever, which mm-hmm. is <laughs> for better or worse, <laughs> which has <laughs> been done. Yep, every oh, King thing is- ever. It's crazy that there's still some stuff that hasn't, though. That's what's so funny. <laughs> yet. It's not done yet. yet. <laughs> yeah. he'll, he'll get there. Oh, yeah. It'll, well, and it'll not in a feature a capacity either, because there's a lot of a lot of student films do King adaptations because he famously will give you the rights for a dollar. Dollar oh, babies, yeah. So he just ended that like a few weeks ago. Oh, no. oh really? Yeah. So there was a woman who has kind of like that's been her job to handle like the legal part of it and to like kind of coordinate all of that. And mm-hmm. she's been doing it for decades and she retired. Oh. And so now they're like, all right, dollar babies are done. 
it dies oh. with her, I guess. Well, no, yeah, she's well, not yeah. dead. She's not dead. You know what I mean? But it, I think it was just one of those things. And I guess, like, his lawyers obviously have been telling him for years, like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Right. You can't like, just give this, this shit away. Not, yeah. So, like, for years, they've been just like, this is like, I mean, because obviously he doesn't make any money. It actually costs them a lot of money for like, right. the legal side of things, like, and yeah. make, you know, monitoring and making sure all everything's like up to snuff and paying this woman right and so finally i think it was just like all right and he's i mean come on he's like almost 80 years old so it's like just just enjoy it just enjoy with your time and just take a break right. and so all our babies are done well i always appreciated that he did that though because he's really just encouraging like the next generation of filmmaker yes. and just and particularly yes. now that filmmaking has become a lot easier. Everyone has a, a video, uh, like a movie camera on their phone, on their person at all times. Yeah. Like he's really just encouraging people to tell stories and to tell his stories in interesting ways. And I think he'd be the first one to admit, no, they're not all that good. In fact, most of them are pretty bad, but you know, he's encouraging them to make stuff and to learn. And I, I, I don't know. I always admired that about him and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to see it go, but I'm glad it lasted well, as long as it did. I know. Such a unique thing about him. Mm -hmm. So now do the adaptations uh, get more like hyper-focused and, and better maybe as a whole because of that? Uh, well, yeah. TBD. I mean, we're yeah. going to see. Yeah, I will see, right? I mean, yeah. there have been plenty of big budget studio adaptations of his work in the last, you know, 10, 20 years that have not panned out. Well. At least well, he'll be making more money off of them. I think that yeah. at least we can say yeah. that. Like, I mean, some of the recent ones, like The Boogeyman, which just came out last year, I mean, that's based off of a short story, right? Mm. And so it's like, okay, how are you going to make a feature out of this, like, 20-some page short story? Some would argue that, like, well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, <laughs> right? Right, right? And so, like, sometimes it's, like, hard to flush out something like that or because it's, like, Sometimes, what do they say? Brevity is the soul of wit. Something mm -hmm. I could learn, but yes. I haven't learned that yet. But, <laughs> you know, Neither sometimes, have we. <laughs> you know, I, sometimes I think King understands that. And like, this is just needs to be a short story. Right. But some people are like, oh, let's make a whole feature film about this. It doesn't yeah. always necessarily work out. Right. So, or know. let's take one book and I don't know, let's expand it into three. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. It's funny. He's kind of, he kind of goes either way sometimes. Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to make this into an eight book series. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely can do that. Very simple concept. And let's just expand it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Tomatometer score on Christine is a 69%. <laughs> uh, critics yeah, consensus. Nice. <laughs> nice. The cracks are starting to show in John Carpenter's directorial instincts. Disagree. But Christine is nonetheless silly, zippy, fun. Silly, How zippy? Dare they? Look, the critics don't always get it right. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. Especially with Carpenter, it seems like. That, that yeah, <laughs> that does seem to be the, the real consent. I'm honestly surprised Christine is, is that high, to be honest. Um, it's a 57 yeah. on, meta, on Metacritic based on 10 critic reviews. And then really? a, 57, yeah, 57. That's it? I know, man. And then on Letterboxd, it's a 3.5. This is a fine film. It is. That's I more like it. Agree. Like I could get with that letterbox score for sure. Uh, yeah. Rachel, out of five stars, how do you, I don't think I need to ask this question, but I'm going to ask this question <laughs> out of five stars. How do you rate John Carpenter's Stephen King's Christine or Stephen King's John Carpenter's Christine? Five. Five stars. Five stars. I knew. All, I knew that's what I've, it was going to be. And I've yeah, it was five stars the first time I've seen it. I've seen it a million more times, and it's always I'm always like, God, I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a perfect film? Maybe for me. <laughs> and look, that's film for me. <laughs> that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Look, art is art is inherently subjective, and. Mm -hmm. Perf a perfect film means different things to different people. And I am, I'm glad that this is a perfect film for you. I am. Thank you. Uh, Tucker, what do you rate Stephen King's John Carpenter's Christine? This is a solid three out of five for me. I really like this movie. I like it a lot. I don't know if it's something that's going to become a mainstay on the rotation, 
but I did have a really good time with it. And I love the carpenter of it all. Even if I didn't think there was as much as there could have been in it, Mm -hmm. I still really, really solid. Really like this one. Uh, It was, it was a three out of five for me the first time I watched it, but this time, I don't know. It, it hit this time. It hit real well. Uh, I'm giving it a four out of five this time. So yay. Yeah. We're we're covering all our bases here. (laughs) We are. We are. Nice, nice, solid through line there. No, it, this, this film, this film rips. I, I had a blast with it and, um, I, I would like to see it again. I don't know when, maybe in a, maybe in a couple of years, I'll, I'll sit down with it again and, and re-engage and, uh, maybe find some more stuff I didn't see in it the next time. But yeah, I am, I am excited to, uh, to get back into this one and maybe watch some more Carpenter movies. I don't know. It's starting to snow. I mean, it's, the snow is here, so might be time to watch the thing wait have you not seen it have you seen the thing oh of course i have the thing okay. is like my favorite I, I just, horror movie yeah no okay. i love oh, the wait. thing i thought i've heard you say that you have okay i just the way you said it, i was like wait have you not seen it <laughs> okay no that's no, i i watched all of carpenter in 2020 and before that i think yeah. the only king i or the only carpenter i had seen was the thing and halloween so, all right all right all right yeah. good so steven your your favorite carpenter is the thing obviously obviously and rachel yours is obviously christine uh uh it's a a top three oh wait no you said that might be different yeah because like at the beginning of the podcast you said this is one of my favorite movies right it is so what is I did ask like her. I did ask her her then. favorite carpenter know, earlier, and she I, wrestled with it for a bit. I'm, I'm oh, no. having a hard time committing, but just like I mean, because I love Halloween and I love the thing, I'm just like, if I could only okay, if I could only have one. Oh my gosh! And this is based just solely on me personally. This is not a statement or an indictment on the quality of the other films or their importance <laughs> no. or their impact on the culture. The not at all. These things you dust protest too much, Rachel. <laughs> no, no. I probably no, you're just covering would. your bases. If it's I fine. could never watch another film, I would probably, I would probably take Christine. All right. No. That's okay. Fine. You don't. You do not have anything to be embarrassed about with that. No, you've. Over the course of the last proud. hour and 40 minutes, you have professed your love for Christine. So that, that answer is completely understandable. If I had to pick Christine or Big Trouble, mm. that's a conversation for another day. It would be Christine for me. What out is? of those two. I like Big Trouble, but Christine, I feel like, is for me a little a little more rewatchable. Oh, mm. see, I think I think Big Trouble is imminently rewatchable. I was like, I That's love wild. Big Trouble too. <laughs> as long as we follow Big Trouble with In Little China and not just leave it at Big Trouble, because then that's that really <laughs> weird ass Tim Allen movie that like they had to like push back because of nine eleven and Oh God. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but wow. Oh, you don't you don't know it's it was written by Dave Barry. Uh it's got like Oh, Dave Barry. It's Tim Allen. Did you Allen, guys ever watch that sitcom? Dave's uh, World Dave's with World Harry with Anderson. Harry Anderson? Yeah, I saw and all, like, Shadow Stevens and B. Sash Taylor from Designing Women. Oh, I love me Shaq Taylor. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> fucking a, missing out. Now, Big Trouble you is really were, like... it's it's Tim Allen. It's like Jason Lee is in it. Oh word! I forget who the female lead of it is. Um, I feel like someone famous is also playing his daughter. I think Janine Garofalo's in there somewhere. Patrick Warburton, Dennis Farina. It's got a great cast, but it's not a good movie. You literally, I've Where? literally never heard of this, and I, you could be making this up, and I wouldn't know. I, I it could be. You'll have to look it up and find out. <laughs> I'll never know. There's no way I could find that. <laughs> There's never no way know. I'm going to look it up. So <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> Rachel. It has been such an absolute pleasure having you on to talk, Christine. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I honestly cannot thank you enough. This has been an absolute joy. Um, tell tell everybody, first of all, they should they should be tuning into this because you're on it. You shouldn't have to tell them where to find you, but just in case. Sure. Where can the people find you? What's what's going on on all of your shows? Just like tell me everything. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm still kind of sort of on Twitter at Vinyl Girl, G-R-R-R-L, or Instagram at The Vinyl Girl. 
And yeah, on Halloweenies, we're getting ready to dive into just a minor franchise. No big deal. Um, Alien. Ooh. And so excited. We're a little like overwhelmed, but also like super excited and can't wait because we all are obsessed with that franchise. So it'll be a lot of so fun. Good. And then Losers Club. Yeah, just kind of just finished covering the book 112263. Okay. Um, so if anybody's a fan of that, we've got so many episodes and some supplementary episodes and some interviews with some experts on various, um, related things about that book, the history and King. And yeah, it's just incredible. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. And then on the girls on the boys, me and my friend, dear friend, Jen Adams, also from the losers club, Love uh, Jen. talk about. Yeah, I love Jen. Um, talk about the Amazon Prime series, The Boys. So we are just diving into season three of that. And yeah, who knows? By the time season four comes around, we'll probably be caught up. So if you're a Boys fan, you can find that over on the Anatomy of a Scream pod squad feed. Are you doing uh, Are you doing Gen V as well or just The Boys? Well, we're probably going to do Gen V, but it happens in between season three and season four. So we're going right. to, we haven't watched it yet. We're holding off because we want to watch it in chronological, chronological order. order. Okay. Yes. So you are going to do that before you get to season four then. Okay. That's our plan. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Are you going to do like the animated stuff as well or no? No. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe you know, if we get season four, maybe we'll drop that in as we go. But okay. plan right now is just boys, Gen V, and then yeah, we'll see where it goes from there. And are you planning on covering the comics at all? TBD. We, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I would say you don't have to. Having read them, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we brought on some people, um, like our friend, Nicole Goebel, who is also on Pod and the Pendulum. And yeah, she did our, the... our most recent Black Christmas episode. Yeah, yeah. She, she came on and did our season two recap episode, and she has read the comics as well. So she gave us a lot of insight into that and some of the changes, and at least in this part of the of the series and that so she's been she was great kind of illuminating us to some of the the comic book differences from the characters and stuff so mm -hmm. um yes so sometimes we just bring on people who know more about the comics than we do <laughs> so we and say, you don't have to worry about it right take, no, that's, take their word for it yeah <laughs> that's a good call that's a good call and that's it all right just those oh wait and then pod, what am i talking about and then the pot and the pendulum we're also they're covering frankenstein yeah we're doing frankenstein so, i'm on the uh bride of frankenstein episode that's dropping here in a couple days so yeah so yeah definitely check out there because and then we've got a ton of fun stuff planned for the rest of the year too so all the pods all the things what was your franchise of choice that was on the wheel um vhs oh that's gonna be fun that'll be yeah fun so one. that'll be fun to do an anthology one and I've been bugging Mike to do Exorcist for years, so I'm just excited we're finally going to do it. <laughs> just another, you know, no big deal. Just Yeah, just, you know, minor trifle of a franchise, right? Nothing yeah. totemic about that at all. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> awesome. Rachel, thank you so much. It is, it, we will, we need to have you back sooner than later. This has oh just God, been anytime. such a treat. Right on. I'm going to Any hold car you movie. That. Anything. All right, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to pencil you in for Hobbs versus or Hobbs and Shaw is what I'm going to do. So, oh yeah, any Fast and Furious, obsessed with that. If you want to cover the car, 1977. Oh, okay. I, I know <laughs> nothing about that at all. I'm going to dig into that one right on. Um, mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you so much for being here. This. The show that you've been listening to is the Disenfranchised Podcast, um, and you can find us on pretty much any social media platform, uh, mostly though, blue sky, uh, Instagram, letterboxd and Facebook at disenfranch pod. Shoot us an email, disenfranch pod at gmail.com. Let us know how we're doing, or if there are any failed franchise starters, you would like to see us cover, uh, shoot us an email over there. We're actually covering two within the first half of this year. We are covering, uh, two, oft requested ones from our our mailbag so those are coming very soon uh one next month and then one in march so i guess we're covering two in the first quarter so we do get to those some of them later than others but we do get there um disenfranchpod at gmail.com is where you can uh email us about that i'm rambling now it's late i'm tired <laughs> the whiskey's starting to hit um oh no 
Oh no. Um, shoot us, uh, shoot on over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash disenfranch pod, where you can find for just $5 a month, just hours, just hours of content Day. behind that paywall. Maybe Day. weeks. Days, including our weekly show, What Are We Watching?, where we talk about the media that we've consumed over the course of the past week. Tucker and I did got a solid two hours. The longest episode so far by six minutes. I, honestly, it's longer than this episode. We did it, Tucker. We did an episode of, of What Are We Watching? that's longer than the main feed episode. Fuck, finally. <laughs> you've, been, you've been pushing for that forever. <laughs> Um, but that's again, uh, Patreon or patreon.com slash disenfranch pod. And while you're on the internet, or if you don't have the money, uh, you can absolutely go to Apple podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to us and leave us a five-star rating and review, please. And thank you. Doesn't even have to be a lot, just podcast. Good me likey. And we'll take it. Um, as long as it comes with five stars, we'll absolutely take that. That goes a long way to helping us find more people like you, uh, to hear our dulcet tones. Uh, I'm your host, Stephen Foxworthy. You can find me on, uh, Instagram letterbox to blue sky at chewy walrus. The absent Brett Wright can be found on blue sky and Instagram at sus underscore warlock and letterbox as well. Sus underscore warlock or just sus warlock on blue sky. Tucker, where can we find you these days uh you can find me on youtube and instagram at ice 909 that's i-c-e-n-i-n-e the number zero and the number nine and also hey speaking of like leaving reviews and stuff like subscribe to our youtube channel i always forget that we're on youtube i always fucking forget that yes subscribe to our youtube please because sometimes, like, I don't know what happens, but the algorithm will shine upon us and we'll get a lot of views on something. And then the very next one is like one view. <laughs> so, you know, if you if you already listen to the podcast all the time, subscribe to the YouTube just, you know, to if you want to help us out without giving us money for the Patreon. That's all. Also on Instagram is Tuck Mugs. That's Tuck underscore Mugs. Steven just did a guest mug. Sure and did. It was fabulous, uh, which gave me time to sort of work on the two posts that I have brewing right now that I accumulated over the holiday break. Uh, those are both guest mugs as well. One from Jimmy and one from my sister. So it's pretty exciting. I'm pretty excited about it. And you guys should be too. Anybody that subscribes to Tuck Mugs on Instagram. Like, get ready. It's it's coming. And if you have a mug that you want to see featured, just shoot an email to disenfranchpod at gmail.com with a picture or pictures of your mug and a description of how you got it, what it means to you, and what's inside it. That's the format. That's it. Yeah. Join us on Tuck Mugs. Do it. Do it now. Yeah. yeah. And that's all we got. Good heavens. This has been so much fun. Um, this has been our episode on Christine and the start of our three episode Kinganing, the drawing of three. Uh, join us next week for another Stephen King failed franchise starter. Um, until then, I've been your host, Stephen Foxworthy, for my co-host Tucker, the absent Brett Wright, and our incredibly amazing guest, Rachel Reeves. Until next time, God, I hate rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs>